Okay, we're ready to begin. Great, thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us um, for today's Cohort 8 State and Tribal Grantee Training event on sustainability. My name is Gail Jaffe and I'm one of the Senior Prevention Specialists with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. And I'll be facilitating today's event with my colleague Patrice Post, who you were just hearing, and we've also got Zoe Baptista um, on board, who is going to be helping us behind the scenes. So thank you, Zoe. Um, the call today uh, will be recorded, as you just heard, and we will be archiving it on SPRC's website. And I will say um, that this is one of the slides um, that you're looking at right now, right below the image um, of SPRC's um, title slide. You'll see that there um, is a list of downloads. And this is one of two places um, during the presentation. We've got a green arrow that's showing you um, right now where it is. So this is one of two places um, during the presentation where you'll be able to manually go in um, and download those documents. These are things also um, that you will certainly be able to access um, after the webinar when it's archived. Um, they're also available, um, I believe, all of them online. So don't feel compelled to hurry and access all of them um, right now because we do have a limited amount of time today and so I am going to move us forward. Um, but just know that you'll get another opportunity um, if you wanted to pull anything up uh, while we were talking. Okay, so like I said, um, we will be talking about sustainability today. We're so glad to have you with us um, and we picked this topic to get started, um, you know, in terms of the, the training series for Cohort 8 because a number of you have been refunded and have a lot of experience um, in this area and some lessons learned that you can share um, with each other whether or not you've been funded before or not because we realize that we've got some new folks on as well. We're excited to have you talk to one another. Um, so there are approximately seven newer returning grantees for this new cohort, and we wanted to start off the webinar this afternoon by asking each of you to introduce yourself. Zoe has currently unmuted um, the phone lines at this time, or she will in one minute. I think I'm getting ahead of her. Um, but if one of your lines becomes too noisy because of background noise, um, we'll just be muting it uh, just for the benefit of the conversation. Um, and in that case, we'll just ask you to use the chat box on the left um, hand side of your screen. Your microphone um, has been turned be able on. To manually unmute your line um, to if it's a matter of just resolving um, the background noise. So at this point, I'm going to pick one person um, to, or one grant site to get us started in the introductions. Um, and I would ask that you offer up your name, um, the name and location of your grant, and one highlight of the current grant that you're excited about. And I am going to, let me just sort of look at the list of people and see who I know. Um, I'm going to pick on Texas, if that's all right with you, Jenna and Mary Ellen. I had a feeling. <laughs> you know me too well. <laughs> uh, this is Jenna Heiss, um, the Suicide Prevention Coordinator for the Department of State Health Services in Austin, Texas. And I believe um, Mary Ellen Nudd, uh, Vice President of Mental Health America, Texas, uh, is one of our partners. It's also on yes, the call. I'm, right. <laughs> and we are here, obviously, in Texas. Our, we're very excited. Our focus this time is on, uh, we're calling it a Zero Suicide Texas. And we are um, looking to transform our um, public mental health delivery system by infusing it with suicide best practices and um, best practices for intervention, prevention, and postvention. We're very excited. We just found out today on our grantee call that our um, local demonstration site in Denton, Texas, it's a local community mental health center there, um, is screening people in our um, public mental health system using um, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale system. And 
um, uh, 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 we're creating uh, best practices there. And I was just excited today to hear that we've had 100 um, people screened uh, at risk uh, so far in the grant cycle. And so it's just really exciting to think about those people getting the help and support they need. And uh, that's kind of our highlight. Awesome, thank you. Um, thanks, this is Zoe Baptiste. I would just want to jump in and uh, remind everyone, everyone is unmuted for this. I will mute you individually if your line becomes noisy, but just be aware of any background noise where you're located so we can hear each other, thanks. Uh, and this is Jenna. Mary Ellen, would you mind telling them uh, uh, your highlight about the um, online at-risk youth uh, middle school and high school training, the number of trained oh. this quarter? Yes. Do you mind? Um, no, not at all. Um, we're doing the public awareness piece at Mental Health America, and we've been using and helped develop the uh, uh, Cognito online at-risk trainings for the high school and the middle school. And uh, we have uh, this past quarter, I've forgotten the number, I don't have it in front of me, but it was like eight or 9,000, I think. Um, uh, and just this past year, uh, we have, uh, in 2013, uh, really doubled our, our number uh, of folks uh, totally since we uh, started working with them. So we're at 20,000 uh, that have been trained with, uh, and that's, I, oh, it was about, it was about 5,000 this last quarter. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, um, that's um, school, uh, middle school and high school uh, personnel, staff, teachers, administrators. So we're real excited to be kicking it off with a bang here in Texas. Um, as a result of exactly what you're talking about today, I think sustainability coming on the shoulders of our last two grant cycles. Excellent. Um, and thank you so much um, for sharing the highlights and also for kicking off our introductions and being good sports. Um, who would like to go next? Idaho. Go to it, Idaho. Well, good morning, feds and colleagues in uh, at the uh, for the grant. Uh, this is Matt McCarter, and I'm here with my colleague, Karen Hosker. And we're part of the Idaho Lives Project, and one of the things I'm excited about is the commitment of our partner and, and colleagues with the Idaho Suicide Prevention Action Network, because Judy Gabert's on the line, or Gabbert, rather, and she's chiming yep. in from vacation in Mexico. So there's <laughs> commitment. Uh, at any rate, um, we're very excited, and one of the early pieces of evidence um, uh, one of my goals to really build the suicide prevention through this grant is we put out a call for uh, our project mainly has to do with uh, suicide prevention measures uh, implemented in select schools in the state. I'm with the State Department of Education and really focusing on school-aged youth within school communities is our focus. And we put out a call um, to ascertain folks throughout the state that are interested in going through our Train the Trainer program for sources of strength and uh, put out um, uh, some correspondence uh, earlier this week and have already gotten uh, a great number of folks interested, asking questions, when can we start, we're ready to go. So a great deal of interest and enthusiasm in the field for the project. So that's what we're talking about. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Really glad to have you guys with us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Who's up next? I think I've, I'm seeing at least two other grantees um, who have not introduced themselves. And then we've got sort of this mystery guest person who logged in, and I'm not exactly sure where um, that person is um, is joining us from. So I will, I'll just call you out. Um, I see a couple folks from Maine, and I also see um, someone from um, Northwest Indian College as well. Well, this is Actually, Catherine. I think two people from there. Yeah. Hi. Welcome. Well, thanks. This is Catherine Swicker, and I'm the um, Suicide Prevention Coordinator in the state of Maine. And while the state of Maine has had um, funding from SAMHSA and CDC in the past, my role was more on the training side than on the overseeing administrative side. So I, I need to be considered as still kind of new to all of this. 
Um, I believe I have our trainers and folks on the line, Greg Marley, and I'm not sure if the others, so I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves. But I think the biggest thing that I'm excited about is that we're getting staff on board to really get this up and running and moving along. So that would be my biggest um, shout out. And I'll let the others introduce themselves. This is Greg Marley, and um, I'm the kind of trained director of the Maine Suicide Prevention Program and the clinical director of NAMI Maine here. And I'll be overseeing the, the training portions of this and some of the um, outreach into the community. And very happy to be doing that and happy to have um, a new trainer on board and our administrative assistant. Heather, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is Heather Carter. I'm a senior trainer here at NAMI as of, like I don't know, four weeks ago. I'm um, very excited to be a part of all this. And I'm Shelley O'Brien, and I am the training coordinator at NAMI Maine. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Maine. All right. Um, how about you, Northwest Indian College? Hi, this is Bill Connor. Can you hear me okay? You're faint, actually. Um, is it possible to move your mic a bit? How's that? Is that any better? That's a little bit better. Can folks on the phone hear okay? Yes. Okay, great. Just chat in the chat box if you're having trouble. But um, Bill, please go ahead. Uh, so I'm the project director for the witnessing of change. Sort of losing you. I'm sorry. Yeah, let me try. How, is that better? Yay! So much yeah, better. I'm, just, I'm on you. a phone line, so I, I'm just, uh, uh, it was on speakerphone. It doesn't it, no, me. we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm the, pro uh, the uh, project director for the Witnessing Our Future project uh, that it's being uh, sponsored through Northwest Indian College. Um, and uh, it is a project that is working on youth suicide prevention both here at Northwest Indian College and its extended sites uh, throughout the state, as well as um, youth suicide prevention within the Lummi community uh, that the college sits on uh, as part of the Lummi reservation. Uh, the things that, that are exciting that are happening, we just, we just hired our prevention coordinator, and I'll, I'll let her introduce herself. Um, we had f phase one of our project pass through the, uh, the Northwest Indian College IRB which allows us to begin steps in putting the, um, the project together. And where uh, we have a meeting scheduled at the end of this month uh, that will be a meeting of our public-private coalition that I'm very excited about. We, we've identified students, um, community members, elders, uh, uh, Northwest Indian College staff, and uh, some other interested people in the Lummi community uh, who will be a part of this coalition that actually will guide the project. So th all those things are, uh, are exciting as we move forward. And I'll let the uh, other people from Northwest Indian College introduce themselves. Fantastic. Thank you. So my name is Chelsea Ross. Uh, I am the new our future prevention coordinator. This is still my first week on the project, but I'm very excited to be a part of this, and I look forward to And um, Chelsea, did we just lose you? Pardon? No, I, I was handing it over to Colleen here. Yeah. Ah, oh, got it. I'm sorry. I wasn't sure what I was hearing. Yeah, I'm, sh I'm sharing the, the webinar with Chelsea, and I'm Colleen Berg. I'm the project uh, coordinator for this project, and I guess I'm mostly excited because we're going to be meeting with all our community members that are going to be helping us direct this project. And so 
that's um, we're still in the beginning stages. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to have you with us um, today as well. Um, before I pass things um, back to Zoe, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the features of Connect Pro, the platform that we're using for today's event, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any of the remaining sites. We just have a couple um, we haven't heard from, and I think everybody um, already spoke up, but did we miss anyone? Um, hi. Elix Mello with uh, New Hampshire. Sorry. Um, and uh, we are. Can you, hear me? Can you hear me okay? Not very well. You're breaking up. I'm sorry. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, I work for NAMI New Hampshire, and our state has. Um, now we've used our third round of Garrett Lee Smith funding, which we're very excited about. Um, gives us a great opportunity to build on some of the work that we've been able to do in the past um, through this grant and other um, initiatives. And so building out on that capacity, um, one way that we're going to do that is work through three of our regional public health networks, which is very much um, understanding, of course, the public health and sort of the socio-ecological approach and uh, working through them doing training that we've been doing around the state, which includes um, the Connect to the Connect. We'll also do some other trainings, like the Tom training and AMSR um, with them. Uh, we'll continue to uh, promote some of our statewide initiatives, uh, as well as our state suicide prevention plan and our suicide prevention council. Um, and we're going to do some very targeted work now with high-risk populations um, identified, including 18 to 24-year-olds, um, LGBT, uh, ethnic minority, refugee populations, um, and um, some young folks that are involved in the legal and um, substance use systems. Um, and we're going to work with uh, our state hospital, um, in partnering with them on a project called Project Red, where they do outreach and follow-up people who have been discharged from the hospital to make sure that they are actually integrated and getting follow-up in the community. And we're going to do that by targeting the population that's up to 24 year old and following up with their families and making sure, again, that they're connected with services, but also doing training with them, their families, their support systems, which might be the school, might be landlords, it might be employers, you know, they're over 18, to ensure that everybody builds a safety net. Pirates. And we'll also be working with our, our crisis line they, that answers the NSPL call to follow up uh, as well. So those are kind of the key components of our project. Um, Great. Thank you so much, Elaine. I'm glad that we didn't miss you in the introductions. Um, and at this point, I am going to hand things over um, to Zoe again to talk about the technology. and. Elaine, we were still hearing um, some issues with your phone line and had mentioned previously that we may need to mute people um, here and there if there is background noise. The chat is always available, um, so we can let you know um, if we do need to, um, to mute anyone. So, Zoe? Hi. Um, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Um, if you're having any technical problems connecting to the meeting, um, please call SPRC at 617-618-2380 or Adobe Connect at 1-800-422-3623. If you have any questions at any time, you can type them in the chat box. Um, everyone will be unmuted for the entire call, so please be aware of background noise. I'm going to try hard not to mute anybody, um, but I have been muting a couple people, and you'll get a message that you've been muted, and then I'll try to unmute you and see if it's still noisy. Um, but I'm trying the, we're trying to keep it as quiet as possible. Um, and finally, if you want to make the screen um, larger, you can click on the full screen button on your, um, on your computer screen, which is um, located right above where the green arrow is. If you just click on that button, this, the presentation will get larger and you can see it more clearly. If you click on it again, it will get smaller again. Uh, it's just a nice feature. That's all. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Patrice. Well, greetings, everyone, and thank you uh, again for attending today. 
As Gil stated earlier, I am Patrice Post. I actually am a senior prevention specialist with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. And as many of you kind of already know, um, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center um, has many facets to it. So I'm going to do a little bit of an overview for you. Um, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center was actually established in 2002. Um, SPRC is the nation's first and actually only uh, federally funded suicide prevention resource center. And the resource center provides training um, as well as field support and services such as like the clearinghouse for all pertinent best practice information regarding suicide prevention. We do this by having um, a technical assistance center for grantees and communities. And we do that through ongoing guidance and uh, support, especially through like strategic planning, um, working with diverse populations, is kind of like Aileen mentioned, and assessing community needs and readiness and a whole variety of other things. Uh, we also have a training institute for providers, prevention practitioners, and others. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're a national resource center, including a best practice registry specific for suicide prevention. And we're an influencer and a leader of science, policy, and practice. And we do this by promoting evaluation of suicide prevention programs to ensure that effective techniques, strategies, and recommended best practices are made available. We are funded by the Sub um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, or SAMHSA. And we're actually housed within the Education Development Center. Um, in 2012, the, the SAMHSA asked SPRC to actually assess sustainability among the Garrett Lee Smith uh, grantees whose grant period had actually ended. Leaving the Legacy, which is available for you to download in um, the, the lower portion of the webinar, um, provides recommendations to address suicide in diverse settings, regardless of funding sources. And today, what I'm going to do is actually share with you five recommendations for sustaining suicide prevention programs that many of you will undoubtedly be very familiar with. So first, we recommend adopting a sustainability mindset. And what this means is like when we were talking with um, suicide prevention leaders and groups, what they felt this should was was is is a maintaining it's like maintaining a vision of sustainability throughout the program cycle, from design to implementation to evaluation, and always keeping in mind that whatever funding they have is time limited. And then program leaders just create a vision for what they want to have in place when funding ceases. The second is we recommend um, catalyzing mo momentum. And some of you actually mentioned this uh, when you were doing your introductions. And what this is is that suicide prevention efforts um, in your settings and, and communities should really look at what assets exist in the community. The program should engage diverse stakeholders and influencers, such as like local coalitions, um, community groups, university administrators, community advocates, and so forth, um, to really build support of suicide prevention in the community. And some of the alumni grantees that we actually talked to um, to create this report had, um, had to aspire or actually sustain the local um, efforts of suicide prevention by using such techniques such as like using data to make the case for suicide prevention, um, meeting one-on-one -on -one with potential stakeholders, doing that face-to-face -face, um, kind of stuff, also bringing together diverse uh, stakeholders to create a coalition of individuals that share goals of preventing suicide and other negative outcomes. So this is really about capitalizing on um, kind of shared resources. The third recommendation was fostering strong partner, or strong leadership. And programs should deliberately select and or cultivate a strong leader to spearhead suicide prevention efforts. Um, we all know that leadership is so crucial. And so efforts to identify additional funding, um, additional funding should actually, you know, 
uh, to prioritize excuse me, resources to support staff time so that coordination and leadership of suicide prevention efforts can continue once the initial funding ends, such as um, making sure that when you use or when you have titles of individuals that it's not specifically um, categorized under the Garrett Lee Smith, but it's a title that can be used across the sum. Um, also, you know, ensuring that maybe it's a coordinated partnership, um, you know, with like let's say an Indian Health Service, um, that maybe it's part of the Indian Health Service as well as well as the Garrett Lee Smith. Uh, so a number of notable skills that help programs survive and thrive. Um, especially around these fostering these strong leaderships, with skills like project management, um, development and grant writing, communications, community organizing, strategic planning, coalition building, and of course, a, a passion for the work. Fourth, um, it was cultivating partnerships and really nurturing relationships so that those partners become joint stakeholders with a vested interest in the success of suicide prevention efforts. Programs should strategically select diverse partners and should develop a clear purpose and vision for their partners, including um, coalitions, task forces, and advisory groups. Being really clear in regards to what are you there for um, and what is our purpose. And some of the ways that um, these partners and, and the variety of the roles that they defined um, to support their sustainability is one is partners help to make introductions and connections to key community leaders in order to build trust and buy-in throughout the community. Um, another way is partners collaborated on additional grant applications, provided resources, and became an alternative source of funds for the Garrett Lee, Garrett Lee Smith funding. And then a third way is partners facilitated opportunities to expand suicide prevention efforts beyond the scope of the Garrett Lee Smith really building up that infrastructure so that when um, so when another grant came by or became available, there was that opportunity um, to write it into the grant because it was already it was already built in. And in addition, um, the final recommendation was how to secure additional funding and our resources to sustain suicide prevention efforts. And the sites that were interviewed, they used three main strategies um, to actually secure resources to continue their suicide prevention efforts. Um, the most common was they built strong linkages with various partners um, who then contributed resources to the effort, or they replaced the Garrett Lee Smith funding with other large federal grants or state funding. And these sites um, built infrastructure and momentum, which helped them garner additional funding from other sources. And then the additional uh, one other um, suggestion was integrated grant activities into a larger organization. So like I was indicating with the IHS, um, there was a rare but effective path to sustainability as suicide prevention activities were absorbed into other organizations and departments and their respective budgets. So, I know that was a lot of information, and you'll be able to actually read all of the additional stuff that goes along with these recommendations in that report that I mentioned. But what we would like, actually like to do now is we want to switch gears a bit, because this is really about you. And um, Gil is going to open up with um, a discussion. Thanks so much, Patrice. So we would love to hear from you. Um, we know that, again, some of you have had these GLS grants before, um, others not, or you're not the entity who held it before. Um, but we're really wanting to know from you what aspect of your last grant or of another, you know, say, non-GLS grant, but maybe something that's related to the work that you're going to be doing um, were sustainable. Um, and you know, and that you can say that you're the most proud of at this point. And we're going to be taking notes on the whiteboard um, that is now in front of us. 
And I do just want to remind people that we've opened up phone lines um, at this point, but um, again, if we're uh, getting background noise, you will get the message um, that we've had to mute your phone line, unfortunately. But like I said, the chat is completely available to you on the left-hand side. This is Elaine um, Demello from New Hampshire. Um, if um, you and I could just talk about kind of the cycle of what we've done and how we can see now in our third cycle what started years ago and what's sustained. Um, so we have that history. I know others have had several cycles as well. Um, one of the things we did early on, hopefully you can hear me OK, um, in our first grant cycle was to establish memorandums of understanding with state entities who we thought would be key partners. And that included, oh gosh, Department of Education, Department of Corrections, State Hospital, Bureau of Behavioral Health, um, State Police, you, you know, any, any key stakeholder who might be um, involved in suicide prevention. And that um, has really played out because those partners have stayed on board and that has generated more uh, engagement at the local level because people know, okay, well, my state agency is endorsing this, so my, um, you know, my department is going to endorse it at the local level or my supervisor will endorse it. The other thing that we did was we built, we drafted and um, established protocols that were consistent for everyone so that we got everybody talking on the same page for both prevention and postvention. So as people started to communicate across the state and more and more people got trained, they realized that they were, they were able to communicate in the same language using the same best practices and understanding that they could tie into what each other were doing. Um, and then with the Connect program, we got people really working together as a diverse but comprehensive unit so that a community with a lot of different players had a much better understanding and relationship about how they were to work together if they had somebody at risk, as well as what to do after a suicide occurred. So all of those things have really um, expanded and built out. So people are still using the same protocols. They're still referencing the same memorandums of understanding. Um, the relationships are you know, getting stronger. And the capacity is tremendous because we now see regions where where we used to have to go in and do a lot of the work, they now are not only very strong, but they're mentoring other regions in the state when, that are newer to suicide prevention and post prevention, And they're able to say, hey, if they have a suicide in another part of the state, feel free to call on us, because now we know what to do. And we'll help walk them through it, like you did with us you know, when, when this first happened to us. So, um, a lot of that, I think, is, is, has been mentioned here um, by Patrice is about that grassroots engagement and volunteers and community members and survivors and public health networks and folks who are in that um, in this for the long run, um, really getting engaged, taking it on, and um, getting the skills and um, uh, building relationships that really last. Uh, it's, it's been really rewarding to see that over the long haul. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elaine. That was great. I know a couple of you have chatted in that you are completely new to the program. Um, so no worries in this section. Um, we're just really glad to have you as part of the conversation. Um, and you know, things do occur to you um, that have contributed to sustaining efforts of other projects that you've been um, a part of. Please don't hesitate to contribute them to the conversation. I think that people will still find them valuable. This is Catherine in Maine. OK, go ahead. Yeah, I think that um, I could echo a lot of what New Hampshire has, has already shared. I think one of the things that has been good for our state is that we're small. Although we're large geographically, our population is such that we're, we're often tripping over each other at meetings. And that it's about the same, even with the suicide prevention work. I can be sitting in a room for a transportation committee meeting and seeing some of the same faces that are at um, the suicide prevention advisory council meetings. So that's, that um, networking and strong relationships uh, over, over time has been 
very helpful for us, I think. We're able to call on them, and they're able to call on us is, is really very helpful. Um, I think probably the, the, the area that, which I'm most proud is that we've maintained our statewide crisis hotline number, and that, that's been around for a long time. We also have been able to, even in our really clunky economic times, we've been able to maintain our training um, through NAMI Maine and Greg and his staff, and that's been huge as Maine recently passed a law requiring all public health, uh, excuse me, public education to receive um, gatekeeper training as well as awareness training. So having those, that infrastructure and those relationships already in place has gone a long way to jump-starting that responsibility to, to get thousands of public health, shoot, I keep saying public health, can you tell what I do for a living? Public education folks um, trained. So I think the crisis hotline number and, and being able to keep the, the trainings has been huge for the state of Maine. And Great. This is, this is Greg. I'm going to chime in, and Kathy knew I would, um, to talk about you know, the work we did in the last GLS grant um, that really stands out as being vitally important to kind of sustain the efforts of the training we did to establish uh, school readiness to uh, address the needs of, of students at risk was to really work um, fairly intensively with school districts around the state to establish and foster um, connection and, re and relationships um, within their referral networks. Those mental health, substance abuse, uh, public safety, um, case management, other types of agencies and, and networks um, with whom they might partner um, to connect uh, a student at risk. Um, you know, sometimes schools can act um, fairly insular. And this was uh, really helpful in terms of broadening out their, their resources. Um, we've been pretty proud of that. As you should be. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, and thanks to you, Catherine, as well. And, and I just well, wanted to declare. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify. If, if something and I didn't quite catch the essence of what you stated, please just type it into the chat and we'll make sure that it gets added on there. Because sometimes you talk much faster than I can type. So. No, you ain't hurt nothing yet. <laughs> Once you get to know me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I just talked. I'm forcing myself to not talk fast. Sorry. That just struck me funny. I think this we all do it. Oh, go ahead, Bill. This is Bill Connor from Northwest Indian College. Um, as as I noted in the chat, we're new to GLS, but we we have had a um, a number of previous grants, including uh, a NARCH grant uh, or, or uh, yeah, a NARCH project that was focused on on several different things, but one of them was looking at strengths and resilience um, in several of the Northwest uh, tribal communities, and. Um, as part of that project, or maybe as a central piece of that project, we have a community action board that is made up of um, community leaders uh, within the three different tribal communities uh, that are part of the, that NARCH grant. And the concern about suicide was actually raised by that community action board. and. Um, the application for this grant was driven by the communities, um, and so we're hoping to be able to use that that strength of communities already having a, a, an identified concern and addressing suicide prevention because it is a concern of those communities. Nice. Thank you, Bill, for sharing that.
This is Mary from John Hopkins. I don't know if you can hear me. We can. Hello. Hi. I'm sorry I wasn't able to introduce myself at the beginning. I'm taking the call from the car. Um, so hopefully you, can, you guys will be able to you know, continue to hear me okay. But um, I wanted to share that I think, um, so I'm representing the John Hopkins White Mountain Apache grant. We've had uh, several rounds of funding too. And I think one of our efforts that's really uh, been very sustainable that's uh, stuck around all three rounds of funding has been our elders council. Um, that our local staff have really uh, worked hard to uh, put together. But the enthusiasm um, and the knowledge and wisdom of the elders, I think, has really just uh, kept it going. And as part of that effort, they, um, the elders go to the schools um, and deliver uh, lessons to the youth on the culture and tradition. And they also do field trips to sacred sites on the reservation. And um, I think one of the reasons it's sustainable is because it's really their volunteer efforts that are doing it. Um, so it's sort of you know low cost, um, and it's really their time, and they're they're so enthusiastic to do it, um, and the kids and the community love it so much, and we're uh, we are very proud of this. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mary. I'm really glad that you're able to join us today, um, and drive safe while you're with us. Um, okay, one last chance um, for folks to contribute, and then we are going to move to a poll question. Um, so Actually, I think Gil, we just, yes. This is Patrice. Um, there was a question, and one of the questions, and maybe some of the um, older grantees can answer this, is, you know, they, they've always talked about having real strong champions. Um, how, how have they been able to maintain those strong, consistent champions? This is Catherine in Maine. Um, I think one of the things that's been helpful um, for us is we have a strong group of um, folks who've lost loved ones to suicide. And they've really taken a lead role in bringing attention to the issue in the state, around the state of Maine. They're, they make phone calls, and they attend meetings, and just are, are strong advocates and are always willing to you know, do whatever it is they can. And when provided opportunities to be proactive, they, they jump on it. We, as I said earlier, we recently had legislation passed in the state of Maine for public schools and staff for training, and that truly came out of two, two survivors who lost their sons, and they just were tireless. I think the other piece that's been helpful for us is to recognize and identify how other folks can be involved. For example, within law enforcement, in the state of Maine, I, I worked for a long time on firearm safety, and law enforcement was very quick to say, look, we do the, we do the cleanup. We're the aftermath people. We're the, no, we're the people who notify. We don't do prevention. And once they understood the role that they could play in prevention, they were on board, and they've been wonderful advocates. So I think making sure that, we've, that we identify how each person, rather than trying to get law enforcement to do everything or survivors to do a little bit of everything, we just focus on bits and pieces, and, and we're successful. And plus, we do, and, I, and Greg, I need, you need to tell me, we do Caring About Lives in Maine Awards every year, and where we recognize people, schools. We, we recognized a canine this year for her work in finding a woman who had attempted suicide. And so we, each year, at least once or twice a year, we stop and formally recognize with plaques and um, comments the wonderful work that so many people in the state of Maine are doing. Yeah, and a part of that is to recognize that it's not the doctors, it's not the mental health professionals, 
um, alone that are key and integral in suicide prevention. It's really underscoring that foundational message that we give that suicide prevention is up to all of us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so in the interest of time, um, we don't have you for too much longer today, but if there was um, something pressing that anyone else wanted to contribute to this part of the discussion um, at this point, please speak up. Um, otherwise, we will move into our quick poll, and then I'm just going to sum up this section um, a bit before transitioning back to Patrice. Yeah, there's, this is Matt from Idaho, and there's, although we're a new uh, grantee in this opportunity, there's a couple things that, uh, that we have in mind moving into this with an eye towards sustainability. And number one, uh, Idaho, like the rest of the nation, is pretty keyed up on school safety given uh, the Sandy Hooks and the Sparks Nevadas and all the critical incidents that have occurred uh, with school shootings. So uh, I'm doing a lot to frame suicide prevention in the direct context of school safety. Um, and so you can link those two. So folks that that previously, you know, policymakers and, and, and officials that haven't had a keen direct interest in suicide prevention, they're all interested in school safety. So that's how we begin to open the door. Uh, so that's helped get a little bit of traction. And then number two is we're working hard just to collect our baseline data and uh, it, it relative to sustainability. If we do what we uh, hope is going to happen, um, I think the data will speak a lot for itself. In other words, going to reduce and eliminate suicides in specific school communities, and we're going to document exactly how we did it. So those, those are my fantastic. thoughts on the rest of the sustainability. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I will say, I knew you knew folks would have things to contribute to this section, um, so I really appreciate you jumping in. Okay, so um, if you would be so good as to transition us to our poll. So for those of you um, who have developed a sustainability plan, we're curious about what tools you've used um, to do that. And some of these may or may not sound um, familiar to you, but um, I'll read them off and you can kind of tick off and we'll be able to see the results um, in real time. But the first is the Community Toolbox Sustainability Resource um, or Resources, and that's from University of Kansas. SPRC Sustainability Guide, which is a fairly new product from us. Sustainability Planning Guide for Healthy Communities from the CDC. Sustaining the Effort Sustainability Resources from CADCA, the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. Sustainability Evaluation Checklist from Western Michigan University. The SPRC Sustainability Planning Model. Systems of Care Sustainability Toolkit. The Legacy Wheel, um, which up here we're listing um, as being uh, from the Tribal Youth Program, um, and that's one that's specifically adapted for tribes. There's also um, a Legacy Wheel that's available for all audiences, um, too. So um, that's another tool as well. I'm just taking a look. Um, looks like a bunch of people have weighed in here. and. Um, Really excited to see that folks have used the sustainability guide from SPRC. Um, we are pretty proud of that product um, and have been getting really good feedback um, about it. And then it looks like um, CDC got um, a nod, a couple of nods, um, again, towards the SPRC sustainability planning model. Um, and then a nod each um, for systems of care mm -hmm. toolkits and uh, the tribal version of the Legacy Wheel um, as well. And no worries, Catherine. Um, I'm sure that I don't. some of these resources didn't exist when there was sustainability planning um, happening previously. I'm sorry, whoever that is is breaking up a bit. You might want to try typing into I see a few people typing into the chat actually right now. <coughs> Uh, and Patrice is good enough to mention that all of these resources um, that you see here are listed with links included at the end of these slides. And Bill, you've listed um, a toolbox as well that um, 
I know I won't be able to pronounce. I think that was you on the phone um, mentioning it as well. Um, but that's definitely something that I know I would want to look into um, for the tribal grantees that I work with. So thank you for putting that up there. We can add that to the list. That's okay. a toolbox that was uh, developed by our, our, our PI, Stacy Rasmus, um, is involved with a number of programs in Alaska with, for Alaska um, uh, Native Alaska youth, and um, she, uh, she was part of the development of that uh, that toolbox program for for Alaska Native youth. Oh, nice! Is that a bit something that is available um, online to folks? You know, I don't know. I'd have to ask her about that. I know okay. she has hard copies, but I don't know if there's electronic copy that uh, is is publicly available. Okay, cool. I know that we're just always looking um, for additional resources, particularly those that will be relevant um, for tribal communities. So, sure. Um, I'll, I'll ask her that. About would, that. Thank you so much. Okay, and thanks everyone um, for weighing in. So, if you would transition us back to the slides right now. Okay, this is going to be brief, and it's, um, I think it's, it's going to be things that um, most of you already know about um, sustainability and, and just the concept of sustainability, and that is that um, not everything is, is designed um, to be sustained and not everything should be sustained, um, and this is something that we're always talking to people about at the beginning of their grants in terms of you know, thinking early on about prioritizing and deciding. Um, what it is that, that you want to see when you do leave your legacy. Um, and looking at findings from monitoring and evaluation should be used proactively uh, for continuous improvement throughout your project um, and the life of the project, and that'll contribute immensely to sustaining um, your priority initiatives. And then um, when evidence does show that an activity outcome or factor um, is either detrimental or insufficient, then that's something um, to consider discontinuing or improving. So I'm going to hand um, the floor back over virtually um, to Patrice for another discussion question. Thanks, Gail. Um, it's so great to hear all of the things that you guys have been doing and all of the you know ideas that you have. And I know that the new grantees or the ones who are just coming on in regards to you know the Garrett Lee Smith. Um, you know, that, that they have the expertise as well, it's just, you know, on other grants or on other occasions. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about is what were your challenges in um, your last grant? And it doesn't necessarily need to be this particular Garrett Lee Smith grant, but, um, you know, it's just related to sustainability. What are some of the challenges that you've been, you kind of have come up with? And then how did you overcome them? This is Catherine. I think one of the challenges is to maintain interest and focus from decision makers, um, particularly during tough financial times. There, everyone feels strongly about their topic and issue. I'm no different when it comes to injury and suicide prevention. So I think it's really, it's, it's been a challenge to keep people's focus on on the issue, which I hearken back to our champions helping to do that, because there are only just so many things that I, within the state agency, am able to do. Um, so that, that would be one of them, I think. Anybody else? Uh, hi, this is Mary Ellen from Texas. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, I would say uh, a really big challenge for us has been uh, turnover, uh, particularly with the, with the larger entities that we work uh, with, like the state agencies. Uh, staff uh, turnover of uh, leadership, directly the people we've been working with. And then at the state legislature, too, that, that continual uh, process of um, educating 
new new uh, new leaders, uh, people to carry the banner for us. So, you know, that's that's uh, been a pretty difficult thing to keep up with, and we do our best. Um, have you have you come up with strategies in regards to um, overcoming those strategies or overcoming those challenges? Yes, you just keep calling people until you get somebody <laughs> 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 to get somebody who li listens to you. Until they get caller ID. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. <laughs> or you that try a different passes. department. <laughs> yeah, you try a different department. You try a different <laughs> legislative aid. Uh, yeah, there is no magic to that. It's it's just uh, roll up your sleeves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you're very right. I mean, whether it be state legislators, tribal council, you know, school administrators, you you just have to be constantly in their ear, talking to them and letting them know about things. So. I I will right. say one uh, once I do I just thought of a strategy that uh, Jenna Heiss has used at at the Texas Department, and and she's very good at that. She seems to have a, a real good grasp on if there's people in different departments that might have one insight. She'll not bug them, but she'll, you know, ask them one question related to suicide prevention that, you know, she's pretty sure they can answer and it will be helpful. And it, it really um, helps to get a buy-in uh, from uh, various people where they aren't being asked to add something to their already existing job. And it's, it, it's turned out in, in later years that when something did come their, come their way, um, they actually thought of the, the Youth Suicide Prevention Project and, and uh, handed it our way. Uh, Mary Ellen, I didn't know you were paying attention. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we actually had a, a question come in. Um, how have you been able to, you, you talked about turnover, how have you been able to maintain staff and students' awareness and active participation? Have you come up with any strategies? Say that again, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, how have you been able to maintain staff and or students' awareness and, um, and active participation? I think for us it's been it's because we're a small state and I think recognizing the people and their work and not we we are we're pretty good at thinking outside the box as far mm -hmm. as we don't just recognize what you would normally th you know it it may not be the school health nurse who does you know the, the the award it may be the janitor who gets the award or the bus driver it's really raising those people up um, and and just trying to trying to like the woman earlier said making the links that that everybody it's sort of like a mutual use use society everybody wins I mean I I think an example for us when we did child passenger safety, we tapped into the media by looking at the like the anchor women who were pregnant, mm -hmm. and we called them, and we had them do child passenger safety stuff for us. Great. And so I think like with with the suicide stuff, it's it's being respectful of of those who have lost loved ones, but also channeling the energy that they so want to use and and be out there. Great. Um, that was actually another question that kind of come up as well. It says, given the rural nature of the state, what are effective ways to spread prevention information statewide? And we actually had a couple of ideas for that. Um, so I'm going to kind of, because I'm trying to be respectful again of time, um, I'm I'm going to kind of answer this question and give some ideas, and then I'm going to kind of do a, 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 um, a wrap up of this particular section. Um, you talked about educating the media, and actually, there's a really great site out there called suicideispreventable.org, um, and it's about you know educating the media and getting them on 
on your side um, and really talking to them and helping them to understand how to report out and, and get your word out. As well as um, the Hunter Institute out of Australia is another great um, resource in order to kind of help with some of those activities. And I wanted to let everybody know too, there's a new um, smartphone app that is just been created. And it's called My3, which is M-Y-3. And it stands for My3 Contacts. Um, and it's another way, of, especially in rural areas, um, to really look at kind of what's available for those particular individuals. And if you want to see about that My3 um, app, you can actually go to my3app.org um, in order to kind of see more about that. So I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, move back to the slides. And um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this section. And, and, and Gail's going to wrap it up by giving you some additional resources. Um, I apologize that we're running out of time. Um, but the strategies uh, in regards to really dealing with, with um, challenges is, is really finding a champion, kind of what was mentioned earlier. Someone who's really willing and able to provide those additional resources. So as a legislator willing to advocate for state funding, or a tribal council willing to support a resolution, or a proclamation, or you know, code, um, a code change in you know, the children's codes, and a, or as a university administrator willing to support staff time to develop the suicide prevention program. Um, really looking at implementing infrastructure development from the very beginning. You are able to reconfigure the program to adjust for utilizing resources more effectively. You know, when you first start out, you may need a lot of resources, but if you really focus in on the infrastructure development, um, you find out that your resources, such as your funding, can be um, um, reconfigured so that you're actually using less funding. Um, sometimes in certain circumstances, or funding can be put towards other, you know, other um, activities or other strategies. And then some, um, you know, and some of these things on here uh, are on the on the PowerPoint. Some of them um, are more sustainable in the long term than others. So, for example, the stockpiling resources or materials or recertifying trainers, such as the training the trainer models, you actually may sustain these activities. In, in a short-term kind of capacity, but they don't establish a long-term solution. Um, so as additional resources will, will be actually needed, um, or they run out, or the, the certifications expire. So as you're kind of um, thinking about these things, you know, as some of the people mentioned earlier on this site, um, really think outside of the box. How do we really do this to ensure that you know, those trainers are supported when the grant funding goes away? Or um, how do we do this uh, just a little bit different? Um, okay, and then and really thinking about you know as you as you're moving forward, how are we going to leave this as a legacy? So um, so again, uh, we would like to really thank everyone for sharing their thoughts and experiences. And as we move into sharing some of the sustainability resources that were mentioned earlier in the poll that Gail did, um, you can actually find these on SPRC's website. But please remember, it's never too early to plan. So Gail? Thanks, Patrice. Um, and I would just underscore um, what you just said in terms of it, it really is never too early to plan. And, um, and I know that you all know that um, already, but we can never emphasize it enough. There are several slides here um, that list resources that uh, we have been mentioning and that some of you have already indicated that you've used here, um, including the sort of more newly developed SPRC sustainability guide. Um, but there are also some other um, resources in here as well. The um, you know, University of Kansas Community Toolbox um, is in here. The, hang on one sec, my slide was just being slow to move. The Tribal Youth Program um, Legacy Wheel um, tool that's online um, is on here as well. Systems of Care Toolkits. Um, so there are a number of these um, that are on here um, that are possible to either you know download with the slides or uh, once we've archived the webinar the slides will be with the webinar and um, you'll be able to get those links 
Um, they're also on our website too, although I have to say that they can be a little bit hard to find sometimes. Um, but they're there. We encourage you to take a look at them if you haven't already and um, to definitely talk with your prevention specialist um, about them. The sooner the better. So on that note, um, I'm going to hand it back to Patrice to close us out. And I would just like to say thanks again um, to all of you for joining us today. Okay. So um, we would really like to thank everyone for participating and for your patience in regards to us kind of um, the time kind of getting past us a little bit here and actually really sharing the information um, that you have gleaned throughout you know, your, your, your grant cycles, whether it be the Garrett Lee Smith or some other grant. Um, and we really hope that if you do have additional ideas or if you have questions that you can please contact Gail or myself um, or your, your prevention specialist um, in regards to any of this material. So again, thank you, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And please look for today's archive webinar on SPRC's website within the next week or so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. The meeting is now over. All the participants have been disconnected.